Good evening, faculty, students, friends, and family. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's lecture recital on the great African-American composer, William Grant Steele, who actually came from Mississippi, and his masterpiece, The Suite for Violin and Piano. This evening, I will discuss the life and musical legacy of William Grant Steele, and in particular, how three artists of the Harlem Renaissance became the programmatic impetus for the suite for violin and piano. In addition, I'll discuss how William Grant Steele was involved in the creation, and I quote, of the new Negro of the Harlem Renaissance through particular musical methods. I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation on this beautiful and uniquely expressive work. William Grant Steele was born in 1895 in Woodville, Mississippi, which is a small town south of Natchez. His mother, Carrie Lena Fambro, was a high school English teacher, and his father, William Grant Steele Sr., often performed as a local band leader. When Steele was only three months old, William Grant Steele Sr. died and the infant still and his mother moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. It was in Arkansas that Still's mother met Charles B. Shepherdson. She later married Charles B. Shepherdson, who nurtured his stepson's musical interest by taking him to operettas and buying red seal recordings of classical music. Also, while growing up during this time, Still often heard his maternal grandmother and Fambro sing Negro spirituals around the house. Ultimately, this served as the beginning of his musical training. Still started violin lessons at the age of 15. He actually taught himself to play clarinet, saxophone, oboe, double bass, cello, and viola. At 16 years old, he graduated from M.W. Gibbs High School in Little Rock. He later attended Wilberforce University, which is a historically black college and university in Ohio. On the left is a picture of him in his class. This is him in a quartet with his fellow students. Although Steele was enrolled in Wilberforce to pursue a career in medicine, the aspiring young musician conducted the university band and began composing and orchestrating. Upon receiving a small amount of money left to him by his father, still left Wilberforce prior to graduation and began studying at the Oberlin Conservatory of Music. Struggling financially, still worked as a janitor at the school and could not afford to study composition at first, Still's teachers at Oberlin, who were impressed with his musical talent, offered him a special scholarship that would enable Still to study composition with Dr. George W. Andrews. Dr. Andrews, who taught composition from 1882 up until his retirement in 1931, took Still under his wing. While playing oboe in Boston with UV Blake's orchestra, for the very popular African-American theatrical show, Shuffle Along, Still became aware that he could not afford to pay for musical lessons and filed for his application at the New England Conservatory of Music. There, the noted composer and teacher, George W. Chadwick, agreed to teach Still free of charge. After four months of training with Chadwick, Still returned to New York and accepted a position of recording director of the Black Swan Phonograph Company. Through a stroke of good fortune, Still learned that Edgar Perez was offering a scholarship in composition to a talented young African-American composer. Thus, Still applied for the scholarship, was accepted, and received extensive training under the tutelage of this famed modernist composer from 1923 to 1925. 
at the end of his college years, still entered the world of commercial pop music, where he primarily performed on violin, cello, and oboe. As an arranger and conductor, still worked for both CBS and Mutual Networks. In the 1930s, still arranged for the radio show known as the Deep River Hour, as pictured on the slide, which featured Willard Robinson, American vocalist, pianist, and composer of popular songs. He also organized the Deep River Orchestra and later hosted the radio show on the NBC network. Earlier in Steele's personal life, he married Grace Bundy, whom he met at Wilberforce, on October 4th, 1915. In 1916, Steele worked in Memphis for the band of W.C. Handy, who was also known as the father of the blues. This slide is a portrait of W.C. Handy. In fact, during this period, still became a highly respected arranger of popular music, often working alongside W.C. Handy. He later joined the United States Navy in 1918 to serve in World War I. After returning home from the war, still maintained his close association with Handy, who then offered still his first job in New York City as an arranger and as a musician on the road traveling through large and small southern towns with Handy's band. Still later moved to Harlem, where he continued to work for Handy and joined the artistic milieu of other important cultural figures of the Harlem Renaissance, as pictured in this montage, such as Langston Hughes, Alan Locke, Arna Bonton, and County Cullen. Although we cannot specifically identify where and when he met these figures, we are certain that Steele worked in close conjunction with Langston Hughes, who began the libretto to Steele's opera, Troubled Island. Ultimately, the Harlem Renaissance and the ideas of Alan Locke, as shown here, influenced the composer. Living in Harlem during the 1920s, to 1930s allotted still the grand opportunity to immerse himself in the artistic circles of, and I quote, the new Negro movement, which was an artistic movement to elevate African American art and artists to be seen as equals to their white counterparts. In other words, the attempt to define African American culture as equal to Western culture and to somehow elevate African-American artists to a level equal to European artists. In a way, still absorb the visions of Alan Locke and other spokesmen of the epoch and reified these concepts in music. In his alignment with Alan Locke and the artistic ideals of the Harlem Renaissance, still wanted a distinctive African-American musical idiom to be recognized within the ranks of European art music. African American musical traits were prominent as early as the 1920s within the Harlem Renaissance, which was the intellectual rebirthing of both literary and artistic pursuits within the African American community. Still, who produced some of the most widely recognized musical manifestations of the era, utilized African-American musical idioms in his compositions. Ultimately, the use of these traits contributed to Steele's personal musical style and to the widespread employment of these idioms as a cultural bridge in the broader world of art music. Thus, his compositions include careful applications of African-American musical practices, notably the blues scale, pentatonic patterns, syncopated figures, and other rhythmic refinements. You will hear those characteristics in the suite and several demonstrations we will perform. As Steele came into his artistic maturity with the ballet, Sajhi, and his first symphony, subtitled The African 
American, excuse me, the Afro-American symphony, which were both completed in 1930, his accomplishments were finally internationally recognized. Sachi was first performed in 1931 under the direction of Howard Hansen at the Eastman School of Music. The Afro-American symphony was the first symphony written by an African-American and performed by a leading orchestra. It was premiered in 1931 by the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra. These are pictures of still conducting, what may have been rehearsals for the ballet or the symphony. In 1934, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship, the first in a series of awards and commissions that freed him from time-consuming commercial work. He moved to Los Angeles, where he would live until his death in 1978. He was later heralded as the Dean of Afro-American Composers in the light of the accomplishments of his career. His compositional output includes five symphonies, eight operas, and various chamber music and works for solo instruments. The work which we have selected to discuss and perform in this lecture recital is the suite for violin and piano. It's one of five works that Steele wrote for this combination of instruments, some transcriptions, all of which will be part of my dissertation. In 1945, Steele dedicated this work to the husband and wife, violin and piano duo, Louis Kaufman and Annette Kaufman as pictured here. In composing this three movement piece, he was inspired by a selection of sculptures and paintings created in the late 1920s and 1930s by African American artists well known in the Harlem Renaissance movement. In the research files found in the William Grant Steele and Werner Arby collection, we find still summary statement about the work, and I quote, many musicians feel deep kinship with the sister arts. Some adopt writing, painting, or sculpting as avocations, while others are collectors. I have only a layman's appreciation of art. However, when I was asked to compose a suite for violin and piano, I thought of three contemporary Negro artists whom I admire and resolved to try to catch in music my feeling for an outstanding work by each of them. In the works in printing, each movement is identified by a Roman numeral and, in parentheses, the words suggested by, and then the artist's name and artwork title. Movement one of the suite is connected to Richmond Barté's sculpture, African Dancer. Movement two to Sergeant Johnson's 1932 drawing of mother and child. And movement three to Augusta Savage's sculpted bust, Gammon. Richmond Barté, shown here, was born on January 28, 1901, in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. While in his early 20s, initially studying painting at the Art Institute of Chicago, his attention turned to anatomy and sculpture. He was also fascinated with dance. He reportedly even studied dance. The human body, he felt, was itself a physical artwork and a vehicle of spiritual expression. Barté created African Dancer, a plaster sculpture just over 14 inches tall, in 1933. It is now housed in the Whitney Museum of American Art collection. Here's a picture of African Dancer. As an artist, Barté carefully ascribed to embodying both the spiritual and the rhythmic intensity in his sculptures. In style, this piece is a bit conservative for its time. In other words, quite realistic. 
The female figure in African Dancer has the skull construction of an African American. She is sensuous, both in her nudity and her gesture, appearing to rise up on the balls of her feet with lifted shoulders. The sculpture's face appears at the same time both dignified and ecstatic. It is perhaps these particular traits and the element of rhythm which are captured musically by still. Notice her trance-like expression. The countenance upon her face shows that she is lost. But dancing is both free and, and playful. And we hear this most overtly in the violin. The violin, too, is in a trance of improvised dance. A side note here. Still has a structural integrity in this piece, which may not be obvious at first. He uses the three-part form consistently throughout the work. That may be an element of the elevation of African-American musical idioms. And that attention to formal structure is something that any well-trained musician would recognize and appreciate. Let's take a look at the opening of the first movement, which is heavily accented and contains a vigorous simple meter. The opening of the first movement is marked majestic and celebrates the majesty of the African in America. Immediately, still begins with the G minor pentatonic scale. Now, according to Wilman Talmadge in his article entitled Blue Notes and Blue Tonality, the minor pentatonic is considered the African scale. Celebrating African culture from the first note still recalls an African tribal chant, or call, or maybe even the way a slave work song would sound. Let's listen as Jean performs the opening of the first movement. This thematic pentatonic kernel of melody, which you just heard, permeates the entire first movement and foreshadows the dancing with the violin, who then turns into a drum beat and dances in a way. What better way to show the vigorous indications of Barté's African dancer? If the jaunty violin motif in measure six to eight forms a more percussive marcato question, then measures 10 to 12 represent its lyrical answer or counterpart. Let's hear the whole first part with the introduction and the violin statement. Here, the weary moaning pitch inflections of blue notes can be viewed as invoking the Harlem Renaissance movement. For example, 
the minor dominant, the D flat, which recalls the African-American vernacular, gives Steele's work a flavor reminiscent of the blues idiom in music for the concert hall. As a performer, I, in order to give the music that bluesy flavor, have a natural inclination to insert a carefully measured glissando or slide portamento to the D flat to show that darker quality of the lower third. In a way, the sense of longing, as expressed by the minor dominant, goes hand in hand with the double consciousness often felt by African Americans in the United States during the 1920s to 1930s. Although the black community in Harlem was now a part of the progressively more democratic America, they felt that persisting racial barriers set up by society restricted how much they could participate in various ways in the changing nation. The B section at measure 62 begins with the piano ostinato on the bass blues. Let's listen as Jean demonstrates this style in the left hand. The violin theme is based on the G blues scale. In this section, one can hear the suggestion of suffering. As a musical element in this piece, our glissandi grind or require a rubbing pressure in the left hand, evoking the rough and almost dirty connotation of the blues. The next blues section takes that same melody which you just heard but this time in a three, four time meter. As I play this section, I am always reminded of this image, one of a drunken waltz on a late night in a blues cafe. What do you think? When the first movement opening theme appears at the end of the movement, the violin plays in double and triple and quadruple stops. And the virtuosic coda coattails the end of the opening movement. Was this perhaps an influence of Kaufman to give it that virtuosic flair? In advance, listen for more double stops in the climax of the second movement. The second movement was influenced by Sergeant Johnson's 1932 portrayal of Mother and Child, which is a chalk drawing of an African mother with her child. Here's a picture of the chalk drawing. Sergeant Johnson, as pictured here, was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1888 to mixed ancestry. He lost his father at the age of 12 
and his mother at 17. For a brief time following their deaths, he lived with and was influenced by his uncle, a noted sculptor. Through his career, he produced works in a variety of the media, and in keeping with the ideals of Harlem Renaissance, Alan Locke, who called for the creation of, and I quote again, the new Negro in art, they focused on racial identity. Also orphaned at a young age, Locke himself had a similar burning affection, perhaps a yearning for family, especially for that of motherhood. This roughly two by three foot chalk on paper drawing was created in 1932, and soon thereafter was acquired by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. There are many works by Johnson with this title that show a mother and a, a child in a mother's tender embrace. The subject evokes a sense of warmth, comfort, and safety. In the drawing, the mother, dressed in plain white clothing, rests her head in her hand. Essentially, the encircling arm and countenance upon her face represent a reflective expression of both love and concern for her child. The lullaby quality of Stills' music certainly evokes the comfort of a mother's embrace but also brings to mind traditional spirituals. The songs still heard from his grandmother in his youth. And those songs allude to the comfort and safety of heaven, or perhaps the Lord's embrace. Again, still uses the rounded binary form in mother and child. The movement, whose title suggests a lullaby, is ABA with section A in two parts, separated by a higher octave reiteration of the opening theme. Immediately, in the opening of the second movement, we hear the use of an African polyrhythm, that is a rhythmic three against four. The first is a long triplet, which is then followed by a duple. And together, As a performer, one must be careful not to apply an agogic accent on the first note of the triplet. This blurs the triplet motif and eighth notes. Classical musicians typically do this. This could even be a romantic stylistic idiom. This is the agogic accent. It elongates the first note. as opposed to what still actually writes, which is the triplet followed by the duple. Well, what can we say about the 16th note rest in the opening figure? That 16th note rest could be thought of as an inhalation 
or gasp a mother might get when witnessing the beautiful moments of her children. Still clearly knows how to write an eighth note followed by two sixteenth notes, as we will see in the next figure. The B section is an E minor and begins in measure 42. We then have a quasi-like cadenza in the violin part in measure 61 on your screen, which links us back to the A section. still loved opera, composed opera, and I feel that this movement has the qualities of an aria. In addition, still composes for the violin in the same way a mother would sing a lullaby to her child. The streamlined melody goes on and on and on with no true pauses. This is Augusta Savage, born in 1892, who made small sculpted figures as a young girl, mostly animals, from the red clay of her hometown, Green Cove Springs, Florida. Through a marriage, a childbirth, the loss of her husband, and a remarriage in 1915, she continued to model clay. Her persistent effort and modest success earned her attention and encouragement and, eventually, the opportunity for formal study at New York's all-scholarship school, Cooper Union, in 1921. Although she was rejected for study at Francis Fontainebleau School of Fine Arts because of her race, her objections to this decision garnered her support and her significant success later led to enrollment in a leading Paris art school and to exhibiting and winning prizes at the Paris Salon. Her successful career as an artist and educator against all odds is quite frankly an intriguing story. The 1929 Gammon is considered to be Savage's most successful sculpture Let's take a look at the sculpture. This nine inch bust of a young boy made of plaster painted to look like bronze is in the collection of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. In fact, Savage's nephew was the inspiration for this work. Gammon is a French word inscribed in the work's base, which literally means street urchin, or homeless child. It is a humble portrayal of the subtle maturity of the streetwise African-American children plentiful in the city of Harlem during that time. This kid, he sports a soft fabric cap commonly worn by newsboys. Above his wrinkled and well-worn shirt is his face with a knowing almost skeptical expression. The final movement has a mischievous and playful nature with gyrating syncopated figures in the violin above blues harmony and a driving bass line. As you can see in the picture, Gamma begins with a tipsy four bar introduction in the piano. This is the boogie-woogie style, 
a music genre of blues that became popular during the late 1920s. Here, the style is depicted but is rhythmically displaced, which gives the music a slightly off-balanced or off-kilter feel. Let's listen as Gene plays the opening ostinato. Also, notice here that this is an eight-bar blues figure, which outlines a dominant pentatonic chord with a major ninth. I'm gonna ask Gene to play it again, but the musical upbeat is given an accent, which could be mistaken for the downbeat. This sort of feels like the meter is rhythmically shifted by an eighth. Can we hear that one more time, Gene? Now let's listen to the, another way a boogie woogie pianist might play the introduction with octaves in the left hand. This figure, which repeats, goes hand in hand with the humorously indication. Also, the accents on the upbeat give the music that inherent jazz feel. Here's something very interesting. Still ends each phrase with two quick notes on the downbeat. Essentially, this is a bebop motif of the phrase, which is rhythmically consistent and the element in gamut. Ultimately, the last movement has the fire and rhythmic complexity and structure of bebop. Dizzy Gillespie, an American jazz trumpeter, band leader, composer, educator, and singer, would often describe the ending of those last two 16th notes as being dictated orally with the word bebop. Let us now take a look at the primary rhythmic motif in Gillespie's tune, Groovin' High. As you can see on your screen, in the bebop style of jazz, phrases are often played in horizontal patterns that typically end in the bebop articulation. Now, if we go back to gammon, codified in a bebop context, one could use the syllables ba dude and dooby dude and bebop, which you could actually codify with the beginning of the violin figure. That is ba dude and dude and boot and bebop. Still's writing of bebop suggests two things. One, his awareness of the phrasing employed during that of the Harlem Renaissance. And two, from the modernist viewpoint of the mid 40s of an American. As a performer, we must be careful not to cut the length of the downbeat in the same way as a jazz musician stretches the meter. In several ways, this driving and energetic music inspires us to think of dance. It is fast, energetic, playful, humorous, wiggly, slippery, gyrating. One could just imagine inner city youth of the 40s running the streets and alleyways of Harlem. Let's listen again to the opening four bar motif in measures four through seven. One last characteristic I would like to point out is the swing style in the piano left hand. Listen as Gene performs the left hand melody from measures 21 to 26.
We will now take a short intermission and we'll be excited to present William Grant Still's Suite for Violin and Piano in its entirety. Let me now take this time to thank my most wonderful graduate committee and mentors for their wonderful advice and encouragement. Thank you, Dr. Redfield, Dr. Pello, Dr. Brumbelow, Dr. Russ, Dr. Lee, Dr. Gertson, and Dr. Seraldo. <laughs> 